Um, my question to all of you who are already joined is, uh, do you have the example project running? Uh, because the thing is, we, um, we will, when the time comes in about four minutes, we will start basically rolling with the assumption that everyone, like the expected behavior is that when you run tests, like if you find here, there's a test called, I'll find it, basic spec. Here under test Scala basics, there is basic spec. And the hope and expectation is that it runs, it fails. Okay, it fails, fine. But the hope and expectation is that you have, based on the instructions provided in the meetup instructions, that you have it all uh, running and working, and that the basic spec is running and failing, uh, like it does for me here. So that's my hope. Uh, if you don't have it running and working, then I don't know, write in chat and maybe I can. Uh... Hi again, yes, we see your message. Uh, write in chat and uh, hopefully we can uh, we can help you. The other thing is chat has two options. It's all panelists and all panelists and attendees. So depending on who you want to contact, uh, you may want to um, you may want to do the all panelists and attendees option. I'll be back in a minute. I'll get my tea. Right, I'm back. Uh, yes, uh, Yelena, it does take forever to compile its Scala. <laughs> um, I mean, that's probably one of the main drawbacks of Scala, that depending on how uh, strong your system is, uh, it does take a long while to compile. And also this project, it's actually a project which has a bunch of stuff in it now. It kind of, uh, it's the project that we're using um, for the Scala bootcamp that we're running in Minsk, in Belarus. And because of that, it has a bunch of other things already in it. Like it's not just the Hello World project. I mean, we'll be going mostly through, you know, read quite, quite simple stuff on, 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 on this uh, meetup. But it has a bunch of libraries and um, basically because of that, it does take a while to compile. We are uh, actually in evolution. We are buying like 32 gig MacBooks for all the Scala developers nowadays. And even with that, it does take, uh, it does take a while to compile depending on, the, depending on the project really. Um, hi, I'm Timofeyev's Marks, maybe. Right, how many people do we have and how can I even check how many people we have? Okay, we had 32 participants. <clears throat> Hi, Tris, we see your test message. Okay, so I guess let's start. Um, I hope everyone hears me okay. 
if anyone thinks uh, you don't hear me, then write in chat. And I will try to, um, well, I have a couple of options microphone wise, but I'm hoping that this one is going to work. Uh, so welcome to this first uh, Evolution Gaming um, Scala uh, workshop. They, uh, this is uh, going to be quite an introductory. It doesn't assume that you know uh, Scala. Uh, it does assume that you know some other programming language. Uh, the material that I'm going to base this on is uh, the material that we are doing in Minsk. We are doing a Scala bootcamp in Minsk since, um, I think, January. Uh, and uh, so I hope all of you have um, uh, have checked out the um, bootcamp project, um, Scala bootcamp project from uh, GitHub, and um, that you have it running, that you have it imported in IntelliJ, and you have it running. So the expected behavior that I hope you can uh, reproduce on your system as you will be following along. And it's going to be much more effective if you will be following along, uh, is if you will um, be able to run uh, the project. So hopefully you have all imported it. And if you run a basic spec, you find basic spec here under uh, Com Evolution Gaming Bootcamp Basics. And if you run basic spec, it's gonna run the tests and the tests are all gonna fail because we haven't actually done the work for the um, workshop. I uh, really encourage you, you know, back when I uh, did this lecture in Minsk in January before the whole uh, thing was the travel ban and everything, uh, it was a live lecture with about um, 20 participants in the room and it was quite interactive, you know, we, we went into discussions and questions were asked and this is the part which I'm concerned that is maybe not necessarily going to be easy to do here. So I really encourage you to just write uh, on um, the webinar chat anytime you have questions. And I'll try to take a pause and answer them uh, um, because um, you know that's going to be the most effective way. So. Uh, with that being said, uh, let's open the um, basics. Uh, this is Com Evolution Gaming Basics, and I'm actually going to be uh, going straight into uh, the, um, the actual workshop content. I'm not going to be doing like an introduction to uh, why Scala is great, uh, because I think you can find such introductions previously. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll discuss some of this. Um, as we go along. So, okay. So what do we have here? We have, um, we have a package definition, which is just the way how we group Scala code. It's quite similar. If you're a Java developer, it's, it's, it's very similar. And, um, object here means that we're grouping some code within a static object, basically. Um, and, um, here, we are learning to define values. So we are defining value here, and it's going to be an int value. And we can ask IntelliJ to tell us what is it. Uh, yes, I think, I really hope, there's a question from Yevgenis, if we're going to get a video to watch it later. I really hope we will have a video, because I think Zoom is reporting, a recording right now. The thing is, this is our first remote uh, um, webinar, and uh, this is the first time we're using Zoom. So how is that going to actually work? We'll see afterwards. I'm just hoping it's going to work fine. Um, yeah, so this is defining a value, uh, and this is defining a variable. So a value is something that you define once, and then you cannot really assign a different thing to it. This here is not going to compile. It's going to tell you the reassignment to val. If any of you are uh, Java developers, it's a bit like you know final in in something. Uh, and if you are uh, TypeScript developers, then this is like const. Um, okay. 
Um, and um, this is good. Uh, values or constant or immutable variables are good. Variables are much more questionable. This here is a variable. And as you can see, we can redefine the variable. But the thing with variables is that uh, often they are more difficult to reason about than values. Uh, because um, a value you assign it once and you always know that it's not really going to change. A variable could change and you have to start thinking about the temporal aspect of your code, what, um, what happened with your uh, value. Now the thing is you can also store uh, some mutable data structures within a value. So you can store like a mutable array in the value um, and then modify that array and this is you know sometimes done sometimes you can't avoid it but uh, it's like a note that it doesn't mean that if it's a value the contents of it are never going to change it will always be pointing to the same thing but the thing it's pointing to could change um, and yeah, so the way we specify types in Scala, it's different from, uh, I think it's similar to TypeScript, it's different from Java, is that uh, a colon and here it's an int, which means it's an integer. We could likewise change this to a long and then it would be a long and it would do some type casting. It would turn this integer into long. We'll get into what's integer, what's long uh, after a while. But overall, they are quite often inferred. Um, types help you catch errors. Uh, and um, if you try to assign uh, values which are incompatible with the type of uh, value that, that you're assigning to, the compiler is going to uh, complain. For example, if we here have a value of type string and instead we're trying to assign an integer to it or maybe some other type of integer, Scala uh, won't really do uh, aut automatic conversion like maybe some other languages would sometimes do. Uh, it's just going to complain and that's a good thing. That helps you catch errors in compile time instead of runtime. Uh, and also the nice thing about how you can think about types is that they are defining a set of all possible values that a particular value uh, can be. So for example, if you have a type Boolean, uh, then it's either true or false. And um, there's, a, I guess in a, some way, there's sometimes a tiny caveat here, but we're not going to go into this. So if we look at all the um, all the viable Boolean values, so here we actually come to the first uh, first uh, exercise, and your task is to uh, here within this set list all the Boolean values, and your goal is here you can see this all Booleans task, all Booleans should contain all possible Boolean values, and your goal is to make the necessary changes here so that the test becomes green. So if I run the tests, your goal is to make the test green. And my hope is actually that you can do this exercise. Uh, I'll, I'll get into that, Mark, just a moment. Uh, your goal is to uh, do these exercises uh, and post in the chat to all panelists and NTs so that we have some um, some um, context that we're all making progress. So uh, Mark is asking the question, if test imports are read, something is missing. Yes, uh, what could be missing? One thing is if you did not install the Scala plugin upon IntelliJ installation, then maybe you don't have a Scala plugin and then maybe everything is broken, then you should install the Scala plugin. Or if you edit it later, then maybe when you open the project, it didn't recognize it as a Scala SBT, so-called simple build tool, not simple at all, um, um, project. And therefore, it didn't really um, 
properly import your project. Uh, the thing that you can try doing is you can open here is excellent uh, Vitaly, but you should, okay, Yelena, looks good. Vitaly, we want your uh, solution as well in the chat, please. Um, so Mark, returning to your question, uh, here you click SVT here on the right side and here you can press, I'm not gonna press otherwise, I'm afraid it's gonna take a while to, to do some uh, things, but here you press this uh, refresh and uh, hopefully it's gonna import um, import um, the necessary dependencies and then your imports will become not red and everything's gonna work. We have a raised hand from someone. Uh, I think you can just write your message in the chat. So we have a bunch of correct uh, solutions. Uh, so this should be the correct solution. Daniels has it correctly as well. Let's run this and see if my solution was correct. Yes, my solution was correct. Um, okay, that's fine. Is anyone still pondering about, does anyone have questions about the subject to this point? Uh, if so, uh, write it in, uh, in the chat. If not, I will make a very brief pause. Uh, okay, Arsenis is asking a question. Uh, could not find or load main class basics basics. Yeah, I think you don't have the Scala plugin properly installed or you don't have the uh, project properly opened. Uh, so you can try refreshing the SBT build. It's um, how to open the test window in an idea. What I'm doing is I'm switching to basic spec and I'm right clicking here, Igor, and pressing, sorry, pressing right clicking here on basic spec and pressing run basic spec. That's how it runs that particular basic spec. There are some other ways. And Vitaly, yes, set X, it means it's a generic. I will give you a really brief minute and uh, and then we'll continue with the other uh, with the other um, with the other uh, uh, topics. All right. So let's carry on, um, let's carry on. So a couple of Boolean uh, operations, they're pretty much as they are in uh, most of the uh, C-like languages, negation, uh, Boolean comparison, uh, logical and logical or, and then we're gonna go through a, a bunch of other uh, data types, maybe not in uh, too much um, um, detail, but, I mean, you have the 8-bit signed integer byte. Okay, actually, we have a question here. Uh, who knows how large do you think if we view the type byte as a set of all possible values? How large would a set of all possible byte values be? If you know the answer, please write in the chat. Yeah, that young folks zoom, that seems really believable. It should indeed be 256. Uh, Vitaly, which byte value do you think you're discriminating against? Yes, 256. That's right. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you got short, which is a 16-bit signed integer. In reality, for whatever reason, it's, it's really not used that much. Uh, int, 
which is the 32-bit integer. There's also a couple of like special values. There's the special constants. There's max value, there's min value uh, that you can use, which are often uh, useful. There's long also with max value, min value. There's a float with a special value of uh, NAN that's following the IEEE 754 uh, standard. And uh, NAN is actually, it has some interesting rules about how comparisons with NAN work. Sometimes they're not very in intuitive. Uh, and also the other thing that you gotta kind of, uh, gotta kind of um, check is how does uh, actually, how do floats work? Like, does anyone know uh, the float comparison result if we add 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 and compare it to 0 0.3, what do we actually get? So Vitaly thinks it's false. Is there anyone who thinks it's actually true? Okay. We have a view from N. Alex Sunkins, that it's true. Okay, but why? Unlikely true. Well, booleans are false or true. They are not unlikely true. Yeah, Vitaly, indeed, this is, um, this is, uh, this is indeed because, because the um, floating values are, uh, I think they're represented what's called the two's complement. Basically they lose some precision from time to time. So in a lot, lot of your like tests, if you're actually testing floating point values, you're gonna use some plus minus epsilon, uh, like add a small, uh, small comparison margin both sides when you're, uh, checking your tests, like you're not generally comparing exact uh, floating point values. Yeah, that is the IEEE 754 standard models, uh, which is describing how they're actually represented and how they, they work. And it's, I think it's similar in Scala as in, I mean, that we're using the JVM, uh, and that's using, uh, using, it's the same way how many other languages are working. Um, okay, and then there's double, which is a 64-bit double precision float. And uh, again, it has some, same as float, it has some special also uh, positive infinity, negative infinity, uh, useful constants according to the standard. And we have a lot of common numerical operations. Addition, maybe the interesting one, but again, it's present in many languages, is the remainder or modulo. Uh, we got chars, which are Unicode characters, so they're 16-bit. We have strings, which are a sequence of chars. And uh, again, as in many languages, we can write uh, fancy characters, alpha, beta, gamma, here within the strings. Uh, the strings can very conveniently be multi-line. So if you start with three quotes, then that's a multi-line. Um, string, yeah, six divided by four is a one. It's because it's integer division. That's treating them as integers and that's, it is integer division. Uh, and the thing is, the thing is that this particular string, it's multi-line, but it's gonna have extra white space here. So it's gonna include these white spaces, which are here, which could sometimes be what you want, but sometimes it's not what you want. Therefore, if you do this pipe symbol and do a strip margin, actually, I mean, strip margin can also take like a custom delimiter, I think. How does that work? Custom delimiter? No, it doesn't. Okay, interesting. I thought it did take a custom delimiter. Well, let's check again. So pipe is just the default. It could also take like, I don't know, ampersand, and then we can replace that with ampersand. It could be the same thing, really. Um, 
anyway, so this thing is going to strip everything which is on the uh, left side, and thus we will not get the extra new lines. The default is the pipe symbol. And then we have string interpolation. So string interpolation, again, as in many languages, I mean, the syntax changes a little bit, but generally you put an S in front of the opening quote, which means it's going to be an interpolated string. You can refer to variables by prepending a dollar sign. And if you want to write a more complex expression, not just a name, or maybe if you are um, if you want to just refer to string one and uh, not you know you right now it's thinking there's a string one while variable here so instead you enclose it into these figure brackets curvy brackets is that what it's called uh, then it's just going to refer to to the variable string one. And same here, you can write them like an actual expression here. Of course, you don't want to make them too complicated expressions, too complex expressions, but 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 you can. Uh, and then here is formatted strings. And here, this is using uh, the standard uh, Java string format uh, formatting. So here, for example, math P will be formatted to four floating point digits uh, after the decimal point, and that's prepended by F. And there's a bunch of common string operations. We can take lengths. Uh, no, if you need both, then you use F because you don't, I mean, I could here use, uh, refer to something else. I don't think I need to format it necessarily. Uh, that's my guess anyway. I haven't tested it. Um, okay. So yeah, so you can do uh, test take two, which takes the first two letters, drop, which drops the first two letters and leave the remaining ones. You can concatenate like this, but of course, sometimes you concatenate like this. Sometimes you want to do it using string interpolation, whatever you think is more readable for you. Uh, and uh, you can do a replace. You can find the index, or if the index isn't fine, then it returns minus one, as do many other uh, languages. Uh, and you can even find substrings, and also you can multiply strings, which is not used that often, but I guess sometimes. And you can do string equality. So there's actually, I want to point out there's two types of equality. So the default Java, because it uses Scala, is generally, I mean, it doesn't always use JVM. There's Scala JS, which uh, doesn't use JVM, which uh, transpiles to uh, JavaScript. And there's Scala native. Uh, but if you run Scala, uh, I mean, the semantics are very close from Scala JS to uh, JVM Scala, regular Scala. So uh, in case this is uh, JVM Scala, then this uh, corresponds to the Java equals method. So this is equality comparison, uh, which in general compares like the innards of these uh, two objects. And this would be a reference equality. So in this particular case, because this is the string, I mean, the actual contents of the string are the same, but they're two separate string objects. Therefore, the equality comparison is going to be true. And the reference equality is going to be false, because that's EQ. So I want to note that this is a bit different from how Java represents that. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. I mean, yes, Evgeny, yes, it's opposite to Java in a way. Uh, the thing is, uh, you don't really, in practice, you don't use the reference equality that much. So Scala has chosen to use the more readable way for the more common way, you know, because in reality, this EQ. I mean, I've, I've sometimes used it, but it's kind of rare. 
and in your business code in general, you're writing just equals. I actually want to note that there are other ways of comparing equality. This double equals sign, uh, it has its limitations because it corresponds to Java equality. It has its limitations in type safety. So there's actually even, uh, even more uh, stronger ways of equality. If you're interested, you can read this link about the cats e EQ type class. Again, if we're gonna be doing a lot of these uh, uh, webinars, eventually we will hopefully get to that. We'll see, depending on how popular they are. Uh, so there's a bunch of equality comparisons. These sort of equals, not equals, with the exclamation mark equals, uh, greater than, uh, less than, greater or equals, less than or equals. Uh, there is a special type. We were thinking of types as defining the set of possible values that a value of that type can have. And thus there is a special type unit. And it only has one possible value. Uh, and that possible value is opening brackets, closed brackets. Uh, and so therefore all unit values are just this one particular value. It comes in handy at times. Sometimes it's quite useful uh, to have a type signature, which you know can only return that one thing. And it's a little bit similar to void in Java. And then there's another special type, uh, which again is often handy. And eventually if we're, we're getting, get to that, then we'll have some examples where it's quite useful. It's nothing. And that one doesn't have any type uh, instances uh, for the type nothing. It's also the bottom type, uh, similar of how I think it is in Haskell. Uh, and then there's another special thing. It's null. It's very evil. We, the Scala people, uh, think of null as being extremely equal. And uh, maybe here you can take uh, a moment of time and think about why we consider null as being extremely equal, evil, even though null is present in Scala. And even though um, null, uh, I mean, you can have a string and then assign null to it. And it's gonna be null, same as in Java. Uh, but we really, we consider it a code smell and we try to avoid it and we only do it if there's like no other way around it and in general we don't do it. So any ideas if you could write in, in chat, uh, why do you think we consider null as a, yes, null pointer exception. So the thing is, any time you work with some types where they could contain null, because you are using nulls in your code, uh, you can, uh, if you're not checking that whether it's null or not, uh, any time you access that type, it could throw a null pointer exception. And it's really, exceptions are overall, sad because they kind of bubble up and then at some point you have to deal with the exception by the point that it's bubbled up you don't really know what to do with it and in case of this uh, null pointer exception uh, they're often very non-descriptive they happen in runtime and we in Scala we have the philosophy that the more errors we can have the compiler catch for us in compile time uh, the happier we are because then we don't have these errors happening in runtime and then, you know, our users or our uh, tier two support are not calling us at night because we like sleeping at night instead of debugging production issues. I mean, that's not to say it never happens, but that's our philosophy anyway. So a lot of what we do in Scala is going to be focused on uh, finding bugs having the compiler find bugs for us in compile time instead of uh, in runtime. Um, so the, non, the, the primitive types are uh, non-nullable, but the other types besides unit and, uh, and not, nothing uh, are nullable. 
Uh, there is actually Scala. Yes, I think the default values for, oh, for primitive string. Uh, there are no primitive string in Scala. Strings are not primitive. Strings are non-primitive types in Scala. They're sequences of uh, characters. Um, Scala is actually uh, rapidly uh, being uh, improved. There is a Scala 3, which is a big project. And the nice thing is that uh, there's a lot of thought going into backwards compatibility. Uh, everyone remembers how the version 3, uh, well, I remember at least how version 3 in some other popular language uh, went and, and how version 2 stuck around for ages. Uh, causing confusion, so Scala is really uh, focused on the backwards on, on the migration paths from Scala 2 to Scala 3. And Scala 3 does important things about null handling. So they basically, if you want to read about it, here's the link to the null handling proposal which is being implemented in Scala 3, which uh, um, depends on union types, similar to how TypeScript has union types to make null handling very explicit so that you know which of your values contain null and which of them don't. But until, like this project is still on Scala 2, until that happens, we avoid nulls. So I'll, I'll take a really brief pause here. And uh, if you have any questions about the topics done to date, then please write them in chat. I'm, uh, I'm going to be moving on then afterwards. Uh, and also, I want to note that we don't really have a set uh, scope that we're hoping to cover on this particular meetup. We'll wrap up when the time says we have to wrap up. Uh, and um, we uh, get as far as we get. And then if we continue another time, we continue from another time. You know, we. Because we're doing this, uh, uh, the Scala Bootcamp at Minsk already for months, basically, we have a lot of material. So we won't, we will certainly run out of time before uh, we run out of um, material. Sorry, yeah, on this lecture, I mean. And I actually, I'm actually checking now how much time we have here. Uh, let's see what questions they are. Uh, nothing versus unit. What does the default function return value? Well, the default function return value, you could say it's unit, but in reality, is it really a function if you're returning unit? Because then what does the function do? And here we're going into the topic of, uh, um, you know, that you should be developing using as much as possible using pure functions, which do something uh, based on uh, parameters and return something useful and don't do side effects. And therefore, I mean, in the real code that you write, your functions will mostly not have unit return values because then they're not really pure functions. But to literally answer the question, the default function return value is unit. Uh, OK, so we are actually continuing for one and a half hours more. That's great. Java has annotations, not null, to protect areas of code from null in compile time. Um, we in Scala, we have uh, linters, Igor. We have linters uh, which are doing null checking, like Scala check and Scala FMT and so forth. Not Scala check, sorry. Uh, Scala FMT and I forgot the name. Uh, so we're mostly using those. We are not really using not null annotations. Uh, I think Scala Steward is a different thing. Scala Steward is uh, keeping your SBT projects up to date. Uh, okay, good question, Yelena. We can write, uh, we can write var in something uh, int, oops. and we can use the default value. I think it's gonna be a null then. 
uh, a, a zero then. Um, but in general, we don't do it that often. We like to, I think, be specific uh, and we don't like using variables. So, so this wouldn't be something that you do often, but you can write that. If it's a class member, it will be initialized to null. If it's just a variable in a method, you have to initialize it. I would assume it's uh, it's handled a similar way, Evgeny, in Scala, except again, you generally, I think it forces you to, uh, it forces you to actually, whoops, it forces you to write this with the underscore or explicitly give it a value. Uh, I mean, this is gonna be an abstract uh, undefined uh, method, which is a different thing. You have to override it. Um, well, it depends in which context it appears, Yelena. If it's in an abstract uh, class or an abstract trait, then it will be considered an abstract uh, val, and it's assumed that it's going to be overridden uh, in a um, subtype. Uh, but you would have to um, specify the type. Um, but if it's a concrete one, then if you don't even specify what it is, it's going to be a compile time error. In general, in general, you don't really want to do this. I mean, uh, all these examples that are like the last few here in the uh, here in the uh, chat, especially the var null string option string underscore, all of these. Uh, I mean, you can write this, but you shouldn't. You will fail code review here at Evolution Gaming. You will fail code review, and somebody will ask you to actually write uh, something else instead. So, uh, so it's a really, it's kind of a theoretical question. Oh yes, if you are writing just to all panelists, then no one else sees your questions. Yeah, panelists and attendees. Oh yeah, so I guess I'm answering a lot of questions and people have no idea why I'm answering those questions because you don't see the questions. Okay, happens. I think let's move on. Expressions, there are computable statements. Um, so this would be an expression. And you can combine them in the block and the nice feature of Scala and it's really, really nice because I actually recently coded in a bunch of other uh, languages and they don't do this. Uh, the last uh, expression in a block is the result of the block. So this block result is going to be six because here we're assigning x to 1.2 and here we're multiplying it by two. So the block result is going to be six and we don't have to do all this return all these extra words, uh, which really just add noise and don't add to the readability of the code, which we have to do in other languages. I think even uh, uh, Kotlin and I mean, I think TypeScript depends if you're writing arrow functions or you're writing regular functions and all that. Uh, here, it's all nicely uh, done. I think, yeah, I think possibly Rust has it. I, I did write some Rust recently then. Uh, I think Rust has this as well, which was very nice. Actually, uh, based on my very limited um, uh, experience with Rust, they have really a lot of common with Scala. It was really nice to, uh, to, to do that. I think even also pattern matching has a lot of similarities with Scala. Like they've really, uh, really done some cool stuff. I mean, uh, if, if, uh, if 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 you look at Scala and and uh, instead you want to learn another cool programming language, um, do Rust. Rust is great. Okay, so let's move on to some more advanced syntactic uh, topics: functions and methods. So functions and methods—they're kind of the same and kind of different. 
And uh, to describe exactly in which ways they're the same and which ways they're different, uh, I'm, it's going to take a lot of time and it's not going to add a lot of value. Uh, the thing is, a uh, function can be thought of as a value and method always has an associated class for it. Uh, but a lot of times you can kind of use one where you would use the other uh, and they act quite similar in many ways. So I'm going to often conflate these terms. I'm not going to do a religious uh, distinction between them at all times because it's not going to add a lot of value. So here's how you define a method. So you have a def method name and then you have a bunch of parameters parameter one was parameter one type parameter two and so forth a colon return type equals which you can't forget and then here in uh, a code block comes you don't have to always use the figure brackets like maybe you have a one-liner uh, method and then you just write here without the curvy brackets uh, also, you can actually have multiple parameter lists sometimes, uh, uh, and that uh, gets you currying. You know, languages like Haskell are auto curried. Here, you can write like parameter, um, uh, and that's sometimes useful, sometimes not. Um, and um, we will not be really. I mean, there's other um, other. Um, lectures further down this uh, program which will be going more into pure functions without side effects impure functions with side effects multiple parameter lists which I actually did touch or type parameters uh, so there's more complexity that that will go into eventually for for methods so but uh, first let's start with uh, this particular task the hello method which is right now as you can see it's not implemented these three uh, question marks means it's like a shortcut, which is actually defined in the standard library <laughs> by just throwing an exception. Here you can see not implemented uh, error was uh, was used. Uh, that this code should still be implemented. So here is a task for you. You implement this method to make this test become green. So now, because I implemented it, it's no longer throwing an exception. This test, when I run the basic spec, is going to turn from red to yellow. What? What did I do here? Oh, string five. I did a recursive thing. Um, so now it became yellow, but it still doesn't work. It still doesn't do what you were expected uh, to do. And let's see who actually is implementing this successfully. I'm going to give you a, a, a little bit of time to implement it. I'll be right back as you, as you implement the method. I'm giving some time. All right, I see a, a lot of um, a lot of correct solutions. This is good. So let's implement our own. And let's see if our uh, test is green. Oh, our test is green. This is, uh, this is great. Um, so my comments about the questions, uh, sub, uh, solutions submitted, like I would do it like this. It's short enough that we don't really need the um, curvy brackets. And also because uh, it doesn't really merge the question mark, uh, sorry, the exclamation mark together with the name, you don't need the curvy brackets here. This is the shortest way how to do it. Uh, we could, of course, do it without string interpolation. It's going to be less pretty, but it's doable. We can even, to make this even more fun, 
We can even, um, as you can see here, because it's just one symbol, I'm using the character and thus I'm using the single quotes. In some other uh, languages like uh, TypeScript, I think the single quotes are pretty much interchangeable with double quotes, not so in Scala. In Scala, double quotes means string, single quotes means character. Uh, but I, I wouldn't do it like this. Uh, I would do the thing that I did here. Okay. So here, let's do another method, also quite a simple one. Uh, we are adding two integers and returning their sum. Right now, this is doing some weird stuff. Yes, uh, Mark, this is indeed, uh, guys, you are still sending a lot of messages to all panelists. Could you switch the messages to all panelists and attendees? Because otherwise I'm commenting on your messages and the people, other, other participants don't know what I'm commenting about. So Mark, if you could resend your message to all panelists and uh, attendees, because uh, uh, yes, like this, thank you. Yes, yeah, so TypeScript also does string interpolation, it's nice. Um, okay, so here let's define method add. We also have here uh, tests for method add. Um, adds two integers, returns their sum. That should be pretty simple, I think. I actually have to admit, I haven't, uh, haven't done, to make the experience more authentic, I haven't uh, really uh, uh, refreshed these. I, I wrote all these exercises back in December or something, and I haven't really refreshed them. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll find some surprises for myself as well. So here you see an interesting thing. You can specify parameter names. So what you can do, since these are named parameters, uh, you can specify in reverse order. Uh, you can specify uh, in reverse order for add. Of course, it doesn't matter because addition is commutative, so therefore it doesn't matter. For some other times, it would... Uh, it would um, it would matter. And methods have, can also have default parameters. So here, if you don't specify the times, then it's gonna assume that times is one. And if you do specify it, it's gonna specify. And here, as you can see, IntelliJ quite nicely shows you the name of the um, parameter, name parameter. Okay. Functions are, as I've said, similar things to methods. They have a slightly different syntax how they're defined. Uh, so this would be one of the syntaxes how functions are defined. So this is the type of the function. This is a function which takes parameter one type, parameter two type, and returns return type. And this here is how we name the parameters for the implementation. This is the implementation. And uh, often the type annotation can be skipped. So for example, here, we can uh, implement the hello function using the hello method. So your task here is to call the hello method in order to make the hello function implemented. And I will here demonstrate that the IntelliJ can help us uh, infer the type parameter like this. So here I removed it and add type annotation returns the function type um, definition. So this is a function which takes a string and returns a string. Uh, same as our hello method did. So here I'm hoping that you can replace this with some sort of implementation using hello method. If you can write your solutions here in uh, chat, it would be great. Well, Igor, yes. Uh, I think yes. Um, but I think then we have to delete more stuff. I was hoping that we would, whoops, I think we, I was hoping we would keep this part. 
and then of course it's like this so this is a working solution um, so our hello function works now what Igor suggested was uh, to do this and that also works and that's even shorter but i mean for the purpose of this task because our goal was to learn how to implement define simple methods we, we just did this where we also specified the uh, the actual parameter we could use it uh, okay so let's assume missing arguments uh i think sometimes you have to do sometimes it depends kind of on what uh scala version you're running it's kind of interesting vitaly maybe you have an older one i think sometimes you have to do this uh and then it will work but i guess i have a new enough scala version that even this works uh yes we can also do the hello method with the underscore which is actually the same thing which i did here just skip the brackets uh and this underscore here which i think we're going to get into this this is here defined this is the first argument this is how it's kind of useful in lambda uh, functions this is the first argument okay anyway um so here string lengths so let's replace this with string lengths if you could implement that one just so you remember how did we uh do the string lengths function so here my question to you is we can write here with the uh kind of empty parameter list, or we can write it without. Which option do you think in idiomatic Scala we should use? With, with or without the empty parameter list? I'm, okay, Arsenis says without. Why, uh, Arsenis, you are still writing to all panelists. If you could be writing to panelists and attendees, and also if you could explain why. Uh, why without or why with? Yeah, it's shorter. So the convention that I use is that if it's a pure function, it's not going to accidentally launch nuclear missiles or remove all the files from the disk. Uh, and it doesn't take parameters, then you write without. That that's the cleaner way. Uh, if, however, it would launch nuclear missiles or if it would destroy all files on the disk, then I would write it with brackets just to indicate that it does side effects. Uh, that's the convention I use. I think that's a commonly used convention in Scala. But since we're generally writing pure functions, um, would you consider Scala to be a Java code optimizer? No, I consider Scala as another programming language, which luckily can compile to Java bytecode, which is awesome because uh, the Java virtual machine is great and it's been optimized for, I don't know, 25 years or however many years. And it has an epic garbage collector and has a lot of existing libraries. It also, compiles, transpiles to JavaScript, so it can be used on the client side. Uh, it's uh, not a better Java. I, I would say Kotlin is the better Java. Uh, Scala is um, probably even more, um, because Scala is kind of like a more practical Haskell for me. Uh, and and it's, um, it's, it's just, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, um, it's the programming language which after, I mean, it has a pretty steep learning curve, but after learning Scala, it's a little bit, 
you kind of you feel what you're missing when you try writing in other programming languages. You kind of you you feel the gap. <laughs> um, okay. So then you can also do this uh, underscore syntax. So here, if you define the add function, uh, then the first underscore refers to the first argument. The second underscore refers to the second argument. Uh, and that's, it's kind of, it's commonly used for simple functions. Uh, you wouldn't, you don't want to overuse it because you can, if like, if you have a lot of parameters that you're getting in a function and you're using this syntax, then after a while, it just looks unreadable and you don't really want that. Um, okay. So this would be the same thing. This add function in line 256 is the same thing as 263. I hope you understand how the underscores get um, mapped, how they get translated. Then there's a special type of method. Uh, this is the main method, which is the equivalent of the Java. Uh, static void main taking string array. Uh, and generally on the JDK, this is the method which if you're writing a command line application in Scala, then this is the method which is gonna be executed uh, by the JVM, which is your kind of entry point into your uh, program. And you can also hear there's some special methods print and print on which write to the console. Uh, in general, you use it for debugging. You don't use it like willy-nilly in your code base because they are not really testable. And it doesn't mean all your Scala code, all your Scala programs are going to have main methods because some libraries will, will do it for you. And for example, if you look at Cat's Effect and the IO app, then you're implementing some other method instead of the main method. So, but I think it's handy to know that the main method exists and it's quite similar to how the uh, static main method in, uh, in Java works. Uh, let's do a Q&A session uh, about, before we go into the higher order functions. Yeah, and again, methods also return the last expression from their implementation block. You don't have to write return there is a return keyword and you should not use it because it does uh, interesting things. I think it's actually implemented using an exception and uh, uh, you don't really want to use it. And overall in Scala, overall in Scala, we are, um, trying to make it so that there is one return point uh, from each uh, method that we don't like return from the method in the middle of the method because that makes it less uh, readable. Uh, Mark is asking, is main a sort of constructor? No, main is more like an entry point. Main is the entry point. Yeah, Andres, thank you. Uh, main is the entry point to your executable application. Andres is actually uh, the backup for today in case I would, and I hope I won't lose my internet connection in case I lose my internet connection that Andres is taking over uh, and uh, continuing the presentation. Um, okay. Um, any other questions before we jump into higher order functions? Yes, Dmitris, I, uh, yes, Mark, um, sorry, okay, Dmitris, uh, do you use the underscore for parameters frequently? No, not that frequently, you use it for simple short functions, uh, which you can still understand well, uh, you don't overuse it. If you overuse it, it really harms readability. I think you use it quite often for single parameter, simple lambda functions. Like if you would do like, I don't know, you have a, oops, oops. You have a list 
and then you would like I don't know filter and filter it based on is empty then here you would use it it's just one underscore this is more readable than if you would do uh, than if you would do this right it's more readable uh, but uh, anytime you're getting a long list of parameters and a lot of these underscores I think even two is pushing it a little bit uh, then um, then it becomes less readable so you don't do it um, I hope I answered your question uh, Dmitris and Marx is asking is it one entry point per executable application uh, yes your project can have multiple uh, main methods and uh, often your project will have one default one um, default uh, main uh, executable specified in your sbt file but you can still choose to execute a different one so if your project is a bunch of i don't know shell scripts except they're not really shell scripts they're common line utilities in scala then you would have a bunch if your project is something else then often you will have just one uh Yevgeny, so what about multiple returns depending on conditions so for example, if you say uh, you define a method depending on conditions uh, and you want to return something else and it's kind of like if A is empty, then you return empty, else you return full. So here you're not really specifying any, there's no return keyword here because that would be bad, right? We don't use return. But here uh, we kind of are, if A is empty, then we're returning the string empty. So we're kind of doing a return here. And otherwise we're doing the return here. So we kind of have multiple returns depending on conditions. We're not doing any sort of return, but. Because this would just be extra, extra point. Is there a switch method for multiple ifs? Yes, Scala has an awesome, awesome switch method, which we're gonna get into, I think in, uh, is it in control structures? If you scroll to control structures, no. Wait, is it still in basics? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm in spec, sorry. <laughs> uh, in control structures, we should have epic switch so here you can see a switch, uh, well, what would be in other languages a switch expression. So here it's a match case if you switch to control structures, but we're gonna get into eventually, we're not gonna get into right now um, because that's, uh, that's still yet to come. But if you wanna jump ahead uh, after the, um, workshop and take a look at it, then that's in control structures Scala. Uh, the pattern matching, it's part of the pattern matching. Okay, any other? Yes, we don't have breaks. I also want to note, I think Rust doesn't have breaks. Uh, Rust also doesn't have breaks, if I remember right from what I did in Rust recently. Um uh, and go okay. Um okay, let's move on to higher order functions. So the nice thing about functions is that they in Scala as a functional programming language. Uh, they are first class citizens. And I mean, that's actually true for a lot of uh, languages nowadays. Uh, they can be passed as parameters to other functions and they can be returned as return values from functions. So here uh, we have a function which returns a function, a method which returns a function. So as you can see, the return type of this method is from string to string. It returns a function which takes a string and returns a string. So this is the return type. Uh, so here we can create a greeter 
which is gonna do the introduction of hello. We're passing hello as an intro parameter. And if we are executing that greeter on world, it's gonna return hello world. So I uh, appreciate that this syntax may seem a bit tricky, a bit cumbersome. It, uh, it takes some time to wrap one's mind around it. So uh, I'm kind of taking a tiny break here and letting you ask uh, questions about this. So here's another example. We're creating a good morning function, which takes a string and returns a string by invoking the greeter kind of function constructor. And here we are executing it and getting good morning world. Or if we would here change good morning Eurus, then we would get good morning Eurus. Uh, any questions about this so far? Use case. Well, there's a lot of use cases. Let's go into this one. The next one, it's a more convoluted uh, example. And it's kind of sort of a use case. So here, uh, we have a function uh, which is going to produce formatters. Formatters from double to string uh, for a particular named parameter. So here it's a formatter for x, for x, uh, and it takes the format function of four decimal places, which we discussed earlier. Uh, and it can be used to, so we can actually break this into pieces a little bit. So we can say a X formatter for decimals. And that's format name double. So like this, so here we are creating this uh, function from double to string, uh, which when passed a double, like math B, is gonna return this. Hey, it's a bit convoluted, but I hope you can, you can follow this. Um, so let's do an exercise. Let's do an exercise. Let's do an exercise, implement the power method, uh, which takes n and returns a function, which when given an int, returns a long, where the long is the received int parameter raised to the n power. And the useful Scala standard library uh, methods that you'll have to use are mathpow for the raising to the n power and double round for rounding doubles to longs. So you can actually write here mathpow and you can click on it and get the description for that. I mean, maybe it's not in the, wait, why is it so long? Uh, it's not, not super readable, but still you can, you can see the definition of, of the math bow, uh, method, which is useful. And also you can use um, double round. So you can do like, uh, this would be a double and you do a round and this turns it into a long. which is gonna be useful. So my hope is that uh, you can implement, replace this part with a proper implementation and uh, make the power uh, test case, which is right now yellow, make it green. So we're making good progress here. The next one, which we wanna uh, fix is the power. So replace this implementation with an implementation of your own 
so that the tests actually pass. So basically, I'm hoping you're making some progress on the uh, on this on implementation of this. Uh, if you are stuck, if you are blocked, if you don't understand what to do, then please write in the chat, and I will help. Otherwise, uh, let's let's uh, let's see. Well, Pedro, I think I need some more details. When you say Scala can work in DevOps environment, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit at loss what exactly you mean by this. Uh, I mean, work in which way? Quite a few of you are still writing to all panelists and not all panelists and attendees. If you could change to all panelists and attendees, it would be great. Okay, so we have a bunch of um, we have a bunch of uh, solutions. I would say probably uh, I think this one is probably the one which I like the best. I think it's the most readable. So let's see if the tests pass. Actually, yes, the tests pass. Okay. Any questions on on this? so far all right um, then let us move on oh hi anton okay let us move on. Uh, let us move on to um, polymorphic methods. Uh, if you have any questions so far on the uh, on the material covered today, just write in chat. Chat. I'll try to uh, notice it and, and answer. So polymorphic methods. These are methods which take type parameters. So they kind of have the type parameters here in square brackets. And uh, they uh, have normal parameters. And uh, so, for example, we can rephrase the format name double to something which works with uh, any A. So we don't really care uh, what is uh, the, um, what A, what type of A it is. We don't really care. Uh, and we can implement this method for any type of A. Um, we just care that we are passed a function which knows how to format the A. Uh, and this is, uh, this is uh, quite, I think, in a way similar to how um, Java does generics. Um, and here's an example of this um, here. So we can actually extract this out as a method. Here we can uh, allow the compiler to infer the types. 
Um, and actually here, I think we can explicitly mark the type parameter if we wanted to. Uh, and if instead here we would try to specify some other type parameter, then Scala would be very upset with us. It would say, listen, here you're trying to pass a function which goes from long to string, but instead here, you are saying that the type parameter is gonna be a string, therefore A is a string, and therefore I'm expecting a string to string. This is wrong, fix your code. So Scala is extremely nice in this, that it often asks you to fix your code uh, ahead of time. We have a question from Alexei. Hi Alexei, can we use too long instead of round? Uh, that's a good question. I actually don't know the answer. Um, I think we have to, uh, I don't know it by heart. Uh, we can try reading it. Oops. Um, actually, um, uh, does anyone know the answer? Is too long the same as round? I, I think in this case, round is more uh, readable. It could very well be that it's doing the same thing. Or it could be that it's just dropping all the values after, uh, yeah, after the decimal point, as Igor says, and therefore, for this particular case, we could use it. And in the general case, it's a different thing. Okay. Uh, tuples. A tuple, <clears throat> It's kind of an immutable list, but it can contain, uh, it contains fixed number of elements. It's immutable and all the elements can have different types. So, and tuples, they're also, it's like a data type. This is a data type, a tuple of string and double, and you use uh, regular uh, brackets to define them. So this is a tuple of two elements, of which first is a string and second one is a double. And this is uh, a tuple of three elements. First is a string, second is a double, third is an int. Uh, here, by the way, we can see that compiler is going to infer the parameters, but I think it's going to infer them to be string and float. No, it's actually string and double. Interesting. So here, if we here said it's a float, then it's going to infer them to string and float. Okay. So yeah, so you can uh, you can um, you can define tuples. Tuples are often uh, useful. Anton, I'm really sorry. I I have barely done any C sharp. I think it's probably similar, but I I don't know. I haven't done C sharp in like 15 years. No, maybe maybe less. Maybe C sharp that isn't 15 years old. Um, but like I only tried it when it came out. But it's probably similar. Uh, so you can access tuples using, again, the underscore syntax. Uh, so uh, this would be the first element. So this would be pepper. And the price would be the second element. Uh, we really try to do this rarely. We think it is a code smell uh, to overuse this. This very quickly, I think even more quickly than just using the underscores for function parameters, this very quickly uh, leads to very unreadable code. So in general, we fail in code reviews, uh, code which uses the syntax, but because you will see code which includes it, it's still good to know this. We use so-called, this is called destructuring a tuple. So if you assign from the tuple to a syntax which you know includes these brackets and the appropriate amount of variables on the left side, then you do the destructuring. I think TypeScript also has destructuring, uh, if I remember right. I think I've done this. And if you don't care about some of the 
if you don't care about some of the uh, components of the tuple, then you can write underscore and it, you know, otherwise if you don't use it, then sometimes your linter is going to complain. Why did you assign a name to it? And then you're not using it. Uh, yes, Daniel, so I think it's similar to tuple unpacking. So Yelena is asking a question. If I want to use 16 as a double, uh, do I have to write 16.0? Um, the thing is, if you have double something, uh, double A, and you have it as a double, then you can write 16, and it's going to be fine. It's going to infer. The thing is, if you are uh, not specifying the type, then it's going to think it's an int. It's, and to make it into a double, you have to write 16.0. And you can explicitly say 16D. Or you can say for a double, or you can say 16F, and then it's going to infer that it's a float. Uh, I hope I answered your question, Elena. Uh, so Vitaly, uh, in tuple and tuple, then tuple underscore one underscore one. Uh, the answer is technically yes, but in practice, you don't want to write this. This is quite unreadable. Uh, we in Scala, uh, idiomatic Scala, uh, we are aware that if you overuse this syntax, then your code starts looking like Perl, and we want our code to be readable and maintainable. The whole philosophy is to make code which is uh, maintainable because the compiler helps, and therefore we are trying to help uh, us write maintainable code, so we wouldn't really be writing tuple underscore one underscore one, and uh, because I don't think it's readable. I think it... Uh, asks your reader to remember what is in the first tuple and what is in the innermost tuple and what um, it, it, it places a burden on the reader. So you want to avoid this. Uh, then, um, I mean, I'm, I'm giving some time to ask you questions about tuple. If, if not, I'm going to like just a little bit of time. I'm going to be moving on to option. So let's check how much I have left. Okay, we're making good progress. Uh, okay, so we will have a bunch of uh, data structures. There is a data structure module a little bit uh, further down the line, but one important data structure is an option. An option is a container which contains, uh, either contains a value or it doesn't. And um, you could also think of it in a way as a list with either zero or one values. It is, I think Java has a similar uh, construct called optional uh, in the more modern Java. And um, uh, the thing is, uh, we use option whenever there is a possibility of an absence of a value or a presence of a value instead of null. So for example, let's assume we have some uh, evil Java API that can return null. Uh, and it will return null. This is evil Java legacy API that we have to um, have to um, that we have to um, call. So here we have good string value and uh, it's an option of string. So in case this is returning null, then we want it to be none. And therefore we would be doing this option evil Java API. Um, so this good string value it's gonna end up being none here, which means when we access it, we will be forced by the compiler to explicitly check, uh, is it present or is it absent? We won't accidentally run into a null pointer exception. And this is the way how we interact with evil legacy Java APIs, which can return null. And unfortunately, a lot of the evil, well, Java legacy APIs, are still returning null. Uh, a lot of them have Scala wrappers, 
But you know, sometimes you just want to call a little little Java API and not have to deal with like actually importing a new dependency into your project. Uh, and therefore, this is a pattern that uh, you find uh, that is uh, important. Uh, so uh, I hope the option is is clear to you. Uh, let's answer. We have some questions here. Uh, yes, Vitaly, I think your suggestions on dealing with tuples are more clear than tuple underscore one, tuple underscore one. I like your suggestions, except of course we would write it in two lines and not use a semicolon. Semicolons are allowed in Scala sometimes, but we don't really use them that much uh, because why should we? Um, and I agree with Andres that in general, if you have uh, tuples, uh, you uh, often want to actually use case classes instead. They're sort of kind of interchangeable, uh, but in reality, case classes often end up being more readable because your elements have names. Yeah, I, I know Vitaly, okay. Uh, question from Yocha, will there be such webinars in the near future? So that depends on you. After this uh, webinar, we will do a survey and ask you various questions about what you wanna see in future webinars. Was it good, was it interesting? Are you interested in the new webinars? Uh, if you say yes, we will be making more webinars uh, because we, uh, love Scala and we think that uh, it's good to uh, to have uh, people learning Scala because every programming language you learn expands your uh, skills as a software developer. Uh, but it really depends if the feedback is going to be, you know, if, uh, this was uh, not what we expected and uh, we were fine, then, uh, then, you know, we won't do <laughs> more webinars. It depends kind of on your feedback and also the format it depends on your feedback. Um, this is just what we did for the Scala Bootcamp in Minsk and I thought it worked very well. So that's why uh, we thought we'll do the same thing here. Uh, right. Uh, and then another interesting uh, data structure, which is either. Uh, either is either left or right and it has two type parameters. Again, similar to how methods have type parameters, also uh, types can have type parameters. It, uh, for example, here is an either from string to int. Of course, you can have other either's. You can have like an either from long to um, option of uh, int, for example. It depends on what your use case is. And the common pattern for either, which you kind of have to remember, is that left is used to indicate errors and right is used to indicate normal values. So a lot of the uh, Scala APIs quite often, uh, instead of, for example, throwing exceptions, which again come with their drawbacks, uh, you instead have um, error values in the left channel of either and normal return values in right channel. Yes, right indicates right value. I actually also want to note some languages like Italian. In Italian, I think left is a sinistra. And sinistra, it reminds you in English of sinister, evil. So uh, it's kind of like, uh, it's easy to remember. I, I mean, I guess if you're Italian, this makes a lot of sense. Um, Okay, so let's do a couple of more uh, exercises. So let's uh, list, and this is, uh, these exercises are all to help you think, and this is gonna, get, gonna be helpful in your journey as uh, hopefully Scala developers, to help think of types as sets of possible values, to make you think of types as sets of possible values. Uh, so let's list all values of the type option of boolean and let's paste uh, answers in the chat and also if you uh, 
If you have any questions, if you're stuck, then write in uh, a chat and I will try to uh, help you as much as possible. And your goal is to make all option booleans or even a lot of these other ones pass. And the other note is that um, you don't care about null. You know, let's assume for these exercises that null doesn't exist, null is evil, our linter is going to catch if we are using null and we are not using null as uh, uh, proper Scala developers, unless we have to deal with, unless we have to deal with um, uh, legacy Java APIs. So Mark is asking, Scala has something like undefined. So undefined in TypeScript, uh, um, I mean, TypeScript has any, TypeScript has undefined, and I think new TypeScript has even something even uh, even even newer. I forgot what the name was. Um, okay, from JavaScript. I mean, we have null. We don't really use it that much. Uh, we have a unit and nothing. Um, I, uh, at the very least, when writing idiomatic Scala, we don't really use anything like undefined. You know, we we don't. Uh, we don't like to be forced into a situation where we don't know what uh, what you know our types are not well defined and structured. I'm not sure if I actually answered the question. If you could give a use case when you would want to use undefined, like if you want to write some JavaScript or TypeScript code and and ask how we would implement it in Scala, it would be easier for me to answer this question. Uh, then, uh, then answer it as an abstract, uh, abstract question. I see Igor is making good progress on the set of uh, option booleans. Uh, we have, wait, we have somebody raising hand. I don't know how this thing works. I think you could just write in the chat instead of raising the hand. I'm actually not sure what to do with raising the hand. I'm not uh, not familiar with the Zoom software. What can I actually do with it? OK, I like Dmitri's solution. I like Igor's solution. Uh, I think what we can do is um, if you finish option boolean, then you can carry on with the others. I will at some point implement them on my own here, just so you can see, but I will not do it now just to give you more time, just to not rush you ahead. We still have a, a time left in this lecture. And also, if you're done with all the exercises, you can start pondering the last question, the lines 388 about can we make a set with all possible byte values? Can we make a set with all possible double values? And can we make a set with all possible uh, string values? Uh, Mark, set order doesn't matter. Set is an unordered, uh, I mean, 
well, at least this set, the default set implementation is unordered. Um, and um, it doesn't matter. Use whatever you think is most readable. I mean, readability does matter. If you would have a, a set of constant names, uh, then I guess you would uh, like, in some cases, when you write your code, you would want to write them in some alphabetic order. So in case you have to adjust the set then or check what's in it uh, just by reading your code that it, it's more readable. All right, so let's do this. Oh, everything worked for me as well. Um, let's see. So, Mark, what uh, what is the warning that you're getting from the compiler? Yes, left without, I mean, you have to include, Nelly, you have to include the unit value. If you want a left of a unit, you have to include the unit value. I'll, I'll, I'll actually scroll up and go in order. I'm like now doing random stuff, um, random order of answering. So let's see. Uh, So Mark is saying his all either unit booleans is having some issues. Let's check why is it not working for Mark. Uh, there are actually uh, some answers related in the chat. It should be uh, right true, not left true. Oh yes, yes, it should be right true because otherwise. What's going on, Mark, is you are having a left value, which is a Boolean, but left should be a unit here. 
okay? So which answers are we not covered in, 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 in chat, Andres, if you've been following? Yeah, so Mark's answer has been uh, covered. Um, there is a question from Helena about uh, if statements uh, with uh, like I think it's see it. I think it's lazy. I think if it's A is false, then B and C won't be executed actually. But yeah. uh, but but if it they won't be executed, uh, yeah. If A is false, yeah. So it's correct. But the thing is, if they're all pure, then it kind of doesn't matter, right? If they do no side effects, then it's just like it doesn't change our program. Hopefully, both A and B and C are all pure expressions. They don't do side effects. Therefore, the point doesn't matter. It's just like a performance question, not the not the code correctness question. Which is why it's lovely to write pure uh, functions and purely functional code without side effects, but then you don't have to worry about uh, the sort of questions, you know, is B and C gonna be uh, checked? Uh, because it doesn't matter, your code will work anyway, even if you suddenly run it under a crazy uh, Scala compiler, which will check them. Uh, it's just easier to reason about code. So, and then we have the question about, uh, can we make a set with all possible uh, various values? So for byte values, yes. And we have some uh, examples here, which I think will work just fine for the all, a set of all possible byte values. Where, where did we have the example? Yes, I like uh, Igor, your solution, except I think Igor, you have a bug in it. Uh, for byte, it should be instead of uh, 1 to 256, it should be 0 to 255. So instead of this, it should be because this one is not going to be uh, right. I think this one is going to be right. And we also have to check there's two and there's until. Yes, two is correct because two is inclusive. Until is exclusive. So until we can do like this. But I think two and 255 is, is better. Um, okay, uh, double. I mean, in theory, yes, there is uh, only a limited amount of doubles and in theory, Yes, but I think the uh, size of the set is probably going to be larger than the available amount of atoms in the universe. Uh, and therefore, we can only theoretically think about a set of all double values. Uh, in practice, it's impossible. It's not going to happen. Um, and for string, uh, again, <laughs> Actually, in Minsk, I said for string it's not possible, and then someone says said that they think that actually strings have a limit uh, of uh, lengths defined in the language specification, uh, and therefore the answer for string is the same as it is for double. In theory, you could think of all the string uh, string uh, a set of all the string values. In practice, it's not going to happen. Uh, it's even more impossible than a set of all the double values, but since even a set of all the double values was in, in practice impossible, more elements than atoms in the universe, uh, then it's the same thing for string. But it's really just like a thought exercise. Uh, so we have finished uh, the basics uh, section. Uh, I, I thought... Uh, it went very well. I, I, I see a lot of uh, really uh, great questions. I see a lot of uh, good solutions for, for all the tasks. Uh, so I am, uh, you know, we're going to be taking some more questions and they can be questions just about Scala. They don't have to be necessarily questions about um, 
the actual lecture. And they can also be comments about uh, future workshops if you want them uh, and what topics you want to concentrate on. Uh, because we do have the option of, of holding them. And also, again, we're going to be sending out a survey after this. Uh, and hopefully, uh, hopefully um, you, can, uh, you can fill it out. Uh, I don't know. Yekaterina, are you here? Uh, are you able to uh, send the link to the survey here in the chat right now? Or are we going to do this a, a bit later? Um, actually, where is Yekaterina? Okay, okay. Yekaterina will be posting the survey shortly here in chat. Um, okay, so any questions right in uh, right in um, right in the chat please andres did you want to add any flavor did you have any thoughts i know that i had you kind of uh, muted and invisible for most of this lecture uh, uh did you uh, did you listen in and did you think oh my god why is yuris telling them these things it should actually be this and that no, no, I actually thought it was uh, quite useful and uh, also was surprised with the amount of questions, so. Yeah, it was great. It was great that we had a lot of questions. If you think we missed any of the questions, if we didn't answer them sufficiently in detail, then, uh, then, uh, Yelena, the cats we were doing at like fifth or sixth lecture in Minsk. Um, um, so I think we even had a homework. The thing about the cat pictures and resources, there was a homework where you had to implement uh, a commonad, uh, which will do blurring of cat pictures. And that's what the cat pictures are about. If you search by the, I mean, if we have, uh, if we have a commonad, did we have commonad? So if we look, no, that's wrong. Sorry, we, which one is using? Uh, let me find where are the cat pictures. Actually, I'm not sure anymore. Under which was it? I think it was under variance. I actually know I, that I did it at one point. Okay, so here, this home task, this is the cat task, and this is reading the cat pictures. Uh, so if you, uh, but it's, uh, I mean, it's not an introductory task. Okay. Uh, yeah, Katerina, you have to make the uh, Google form somehow more visible, I guess. People are saying it's restricted to the organization. Um, what other questions do we have? Uh, Sergey, thank you as well for attending. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, Tris Zomers, do we have a few words about Scala Native? I personally haven't tried Scala Native. I've done Scala JS. I've really enjoyed Scala JS. We actually are building Scala JS projects at Evolution. We have an internal uh, scheduling system which uh, schedules the work for our 7,000 game presenters developed in Scala JS using React and using uh, um, uh, like a Redux flux like uh, thing uh, for, for state management. We have a project in Scala Native. Uh, it's like a small project and our, my colleague Ruslan Tarasov is, uh, is building it with Scala Native. And he is really uh, happy about Scala Native and he spoke fondly of it. And he's like, sometimes in our Scala check, we have a very active Scala Slack chat at Evolution Gaming. And he's sometimes writing some, you know what guys, I did Scala Native again. It was really good and it was really great. Uh, so the person who has tried it, but I, I can't personally speak. I don't know, Andres, have you tried Scala Native? Uh, no, same story for me. Yeah, so maybe maybe someday um, someday we will try Scala Native. Uh, 
then we have a question of uh, do how do you use Scala to JavaScript transpilation development JavaScript libraries? So our uh, our user facing games are actually written in TypeScript. We don't use Scala JS for our actual games because um, Scala does add a footprint because we have a a, a large number of great front end uh, TypeScript developers. So you know uh, we, uh, we we don't have to use Scala for that. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of existing code in TypeScript, and also we concern about performance, concern about loading times, and all that. You know, our games have to run on a very low-end systems, uh, very weird, exotic uh, mobile devices. So we don't use Scala.js for that. We use Scala.js for an internal uh, scheduling system, which is mostly run from. Um, uh, desktops. I mean, it does have a self-service component as well, which is from mobiles. And we use just standard Scala.js uh, compiler to transpile to uh, JavaScript. And uh, it has uh, pros and it has cons. The project began without a single JavaScript TypeScript developer, like they were just Scala guys and they needed to write front end, so they did it in Scala.js. We have some other uh, projects, like I think a dealer module, which is uh, developed also using Scala.js. Uh, instead, uh, it, it has some drawbacks. The main drawback is compilation time. It's quite lengthy for Scala.js. Uh, there were also some unique bugs we were, uh, we were running into in the Scala.js compiler, which I think are still uh, now are fixed. So it hasn't been fully smooth sailing. It's been a great experience. Uh, I think at some point, and maybe still, we have one of the most extensive Scala.js code bases in the world. Uh, but of course, it's kind of closed source, so no one really knows that it's it's a pretty big application which uh, does the scheduling for all of our um, uh, game presenters. I hope I answered uh, your question. So uh, Yekaterin says we have some technical issues with the survey. Sorry about that. Um, it's actually fixed already, so oh, everyone it's fixed. Can, can access. Oh, okay, yeah. I hope it's fixed. Uh, yes, Scala can be really difficult to read if written poorly. Uh, that's, I guess, it's kind of true for a lot of languages, but again, for Scala, uh, it, it happens. So, um, compare closure with Scala. I haven't done closure. Uh, I've done a bit of Lisp a long time ago. I think Clojure is more softly typed than Scala. You know, the types are less strict and Scala does more catching of uh, uh, errors in the compile time as far as I know. And Clojure, I'm always a little bit uh, concerned about uh, the amount of brackets in, in uh, Lisp-like languages. Uh, but again, I think it's somewhat, um, Somewhat getting used to it. Uh, I I think um, you know I'm I'm not really planning to learn closure. Uh, if um, I'm kind of uh, from languages wise, I right now nowadays I enjoy Scala and I enjoy what little Haskell and Rust I do. Um, okay, great that the survey works. Uh, Vitali, thank you, thank you for joining. Any other questions, or we will be gradually wrapping this up. Okay. I think we can wrap it up. The survey works. Please do fill out the survey so we know where to take these uh, in the future. Uh, thank you, Nelly. I'm glad you liked it. Uh, thank you so much for attending, everyone. And we will be uh, we will we will see you next time, hopefully. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.